Hello, and welcome to part two of this um, three-part series, which is not going to include about of Atlantic video comments because I have a feeling they're going to be they require their own video entirely, and therefore I am not going to even attempt to put them into the comment section of this into the discussion of the comments. It's just I'm not silly. I, 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 I'm not going to try that one. So, Churchill Initiatives, World War II, crackpot schemes or good ideas and bad executed. This is going to go through the comments of that. Now, what I mean by that is I'm going through the comments and I'm answering the que where there are questions. It doesn't mean that I'm going to necessarily answer all the question comments because if some of the comments are just hello, I might say hello back, but I will probably go with just skip past them because that saves time and allows me to concentrate on the question ones. Although I do like saying hello back, so I might do that. I might do that. It, 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 it depends on my mood. So without much further ado, and realizing this is roughly heading for the two minute mark. Let's start with the Outmark incident. Now, there are various takes on this. And as I said, I'm doing this from the first comments up. So the first one from Vision. I'm really enjoying these interviews, these videos. Thank you. I'm enjoying them too. Sean V, thank you. Or Richard, thank you. Tom Gasso, 850. Be fair to the Shanos. Didn't they have orders to avoid engaging with the British? Yes, they did. Which was sensible because, let's be honest, whilst they could outmatch any British cruiser at the time. Arguably, they could outmatch any British cruiser. And I'm saying this knowing that one later in the war gets beaten up by HMS Belfast. But that's mainly taking out the bits of it which are exposed, not actually sinking it. And it does eventually get sinked, sunk by a KGB. There is also the point, and a very serious point, that they couldn't fight anything bigger than the British cruiser. Because there is no way they can match up to 10, 11, uh, 10 14 inch guns. No way, uh, 8, 15 inch guns. And if 9, 16 inch guns are there, then they do not want to be anywhere near there. And that's the combinations you're facing. Okay, yes, there's Renan and Repulse, which are six 15-inch guns. But that's still not a nice combination. They're not designed, really, to deal with that level of firepower. They will have to be modified. Because, for starters, they can't fire, equate with that firepower. So, there are legitimate reasons for them to, decide, uh, to avoid engaging with the British. Sigmundish, losing a general. Come on, they're self-propelled. I know, that was probably a bit, a little bit hyperbolic, but yes. He <laughs> he, true, but so, this is from, uh, but sometimes they need a, uh, they need um, something in the rear to start them up, especially in 1939 and 40, before most of the dead wood was cleared out. The beginning months of major wars are always a large spate of retires of generals and admirals. Voluntary or not, no one is telling. Welcome to Home Guard, General. Give him a captain's berth parading farmers, but let him keep the rank title. Too bad they did away with the sea fencibles after the Napoleonic Wars. Would have been a good place to send the yellow admirals in the World Wars. Cork and Ori. Uh, regarding this ongo uh, ongoing Norway isn't lost scenario, you and Drac both like it. I must admit, that is simply not happening. Luftwaffe would do the same to the RN they did to them in the Aegean. And that was very painful, pretty painful. And the ground troops would not fare any better. Their record was far from stellar, and half of them were French. Against uh, Gersberger and Falschmerger, if traitors in control of the government, telling their men to go home? No, not happening. Sure, it could delay the Low Countries and France a few months, but face it, Norway was lost within two to three months at the most. I can see the allure of the idea of tribals winning the campaign on their own, but it was most destined, and long they stayed there, none of them would have sunk from the air. 
Oh, Steve, uh, for starters, please go watch the rest of my videos on Norway. I would refer you to the fact that Quisling, when he walks into the head of the police, uh, police office, in the chief of police officers, and get, demands that the government be arrested, gets told to go home after being asked who, the, who he was. Mm, there are some very interesting people in the Norwegian government, they're not. Tra there aren't a lot of traitors that are holding it to them. What's more of come is the Norwegian government itself has made its own silly decisions. So, and as for the Luftwaffe doing the same to that they did to them in the Aegean, not the nicest way. That's quite literally months, years later, when Luftwaffe has evolved quite a far more formidable maritime capability than they have in 1939, uh, mid beginning of 1940 even to mid-1940. They develop it, yes. And they have some capabilities, but they don't have it at this point. And so Norway is not lost in any way, shape, or form by that. Norway could have been held by Norway if they'd mobilized their troops by, I don't know, shouting on the radio and calling everyone to stay at service and telling them the enemy was coming, or that we were going to high alert in case someone's coming. They might well have been able to do things uh, if they had. Well, basically, that would have saved them. That alone would have saved them. If their troops had been on high alert, and you can sit there and go, "Ah, oh, yes," but what happens if the commander is pro-German, as at Narvik? He seems to have been certainly joins with the Germans later after they've occupied the force, occupied the country. Uh, he might have ordered them not to fire. Well, in a nice way, if you're on high alert, you've got a lot of troops around you who are armed. And you can say, don't fire, don't fire. And they're going, but we've heard on the radio that these people are invading. And they're not Norwegian troops, they're German troops. Um, we're going to start firing. You have to explain yourself to your second in command, to your senior NCOs, to your troops who are all armed, why you're trying to order them not to fire. Again, this doesn't tend to work well. And remember, a large number of Norwegian forces are reservists. As a whole, reservists tend to be even more stubborn when it comes to defending their areas, and even less likely to listen to people going, No, but they could be friends. No. Bill, Bill Pong, Hyperbole, uh, for memories. Yes, there's hyperbole and hyperbole. I like to use both occasionally. So, Wayne Boren, so Jenna's obviously closely related genetically to beagles. Thanks for another thought provoking video. Potentially. Rich Great, heavy bombers in Norway, Sweden has always been one of my favourite tactics in strategy games. Not sure if it was really feasible though, given the German ability to interfere in diplomatic realities. Has the diplomatic correspondence from the time between Sweden and Norway and between them and Britain and Germany ever been fully declassified? Nope. Would Norway have trusted Churchill was really different than from Ch uh, Chamberlain regarding guarantees? Yes, Norway had a lot of different re reality views on Churchill versus Chamberlain. Remember, Churchill has a track record from World War I, from the interwar years, from recently of being intransient, of being voiceless, forceful, the stern, you know, there is a reason he's picked at the time he is. Especially given promises made to the Poles and ongoing phony war in France. I all agreed, but more could have been done. Ben Wilson, with the invasion of Norway, you have got ahead of history. The invasion of Norway was long a lot was long before Arctic convoys, the Soviet Union was a German ally at this time, supplying Germany with all its oils and much of its food. The Armark was owned and operated by the Kriegsmarine, so it had already breached Norwegian New Jersey with its Birch Merchant Navy captives and its cargo of Texas crude. Agreed. But, even if you're not resupplying the Soviet Union and the Arctic convoys, supporting Norway and stopping the invasion of Norway makes a lot of sense, because it's how you bottle the Germans up in the North Sea. Okay? You control the North Sea, if, uh, you even, uh, to control the North Sea and to control the access to the North Atlantic, you need a barrier across and you need control of Norway. If Germany has a failed invasion of Norway, and there are going to be other people who are going to be talking about the Swedish in a second, and I'll get into that, it's a very, very different scenario. So that's the problem. That's why you're doing this. 
Adrian J. Churchill ordered the seizure of four Swedish destroyers on 20th of June 1940, which almost led to war between Sweden and the UK. Destroyers' passage had been notified to both the German and British naval attaches in Stockholm, and none of them had any objections. These were four ex tank destroyers that Sweden had bought in an effort to strengthen the navy. When they got to the Faroe Islands, a British destroyer force, three tribal class destroyers, a force appeared and ordered the surrender of vessels while they were at anchor. As the ships did not have the fuel to reach Sweden, and only two 10 cm guns bore against the British force, the destroyers were surrendered. Squadron commander Tosten Hagman had been an Anglophile, and he was never forgiven by the Navy for not fighting it out, and his career hit a brick wall afterwards. The seizure had been ordered by the war cabinet, who afterwards got cold feet, and the destroyers were returned ten days later. Had Sweden joined the war in 1940 on the German side, it would have surely have joined in the invasion of the USSR in 1941, and with the winter-trained Swedish army fighting alongside Finland in the north, to, uh, in the, north the ice-free ports of the Barents Sea would probably have fallen, making Len Lease much more difficult. Yes. I think not the Barents Sea, it's ah, uh, Yeah, I think I called the sea the wrong one in the earlier video. Ah, uh, well. Apologies. Ah, <sighs> getting my BCs messed up again. It's the Baltic, isn't it? Yeah. It's the Baltic, not the Barents. The Barents is the one in the north, and the Baltic is the one in there. I get them twisted around sometimes geographically. I do apologize. Oh, going back to the questions. Uh, I, my response is, I think I've covered this in video as you know, they use travel class destroyers to secure them. Yeah, uh, my eventual point is, yeah, nicest way, four lightly crewed, not fully armed up, small destroyers versus three tribals armed, fully war crewed and in better positions. My vote on the video, I think, was whilst I respect the idea of resisting for the honour of the flag, actually doing so would not have been a good idea. Adrian J. Good ideas are not a hallmark of the Swedish Navy. In the past, the Navy usually started off with some sort of major disaster whenever Sweden went into war. Mm, to be fair, yes. Uh, Adrian J. In British Norway was a worst case scenario in Swedish World War II diplomacy, as this would 100% make Sweden a battlefield, as Germany would invade Sweden to get to UK, Norway, or to the UK would invade to get the iron ore mines in northern Sweden. If Norway is seen as a threat, then by uh, then, uh, then by Sweden, this would be probably bro a throwback Scandinavian relations a hundred years, especially if Norway did not fight the UK occupation, and could possibly make Sweden become more aligned with the USSR in the post-war environment, being a neutral USSR ally instead of a neutral US ally. It would also most likely have the Swedish nuclear program produce an actual bomb and not just all the R and D and testing, as was the case when the last parts of the program were terminated in the nineteen seventies. I think that's going a bit far. I would also say that you are presuming that Sweden does a lot of things on the Germans because they think they have much of a choice. With a German-controlled Norway and all the rest, they, they think that Germany could invade Sweden if they wish to, especially considering the garrison size in Norway. And it's fairly hefty. Mm, British involved in Norway, especially if it wasn't a British occupation of Norway, but rather Norway being rescued from a German invasion, would be a different matter. My own reading of the Swedish position would suggest to me that if Sweden had, if the Royal Navy, um, if Britain had successfully reinforced Norway along with France and Maybe even if France ends up losing the Low Countries War. Sweden can sell its iron ore to Britain, and that's the thing. Britain will just keep buying the, uh, the Swedish iron ore, which would be useful for the British war industries, and really ramp up our own production. And they will go to full alert. And yes, they'll probably be a target, but they'll probably also say to Germany, oh, we'll sell them as well, sell the iron ore to you as well. You know, and there'll be a competition over who can buy the iron ore more. British troops will be in Norway if the Germans invade Nor and try to invade Sweden. British troops from Nor will, and the Norwegian troops will go and assist Sweden. But Sweden would also be on full alert. This is the thing. I never discount the idea, and we definitely don't have access to their full archives, that the German plan would have included an invasion of Sweden. But you must remember, Sweden goes to full alert. Sweden does the exact opposite. Of Norway. Instead of hesitating, they go to full alert immediately. Basically, their force, armed forces are on a hairpin trigger for the entirety of World War II. Uh, it's... Something happens. <clears throat> We're alert. They're kind of like Switzerland. They take the whole armed neutrality very seriously. 
And that's the difference. I think for Germany, invasion of Sweden is a far more difficult prospect before they have control of Norway. So if they fail to get control of Norway, then Sweden will be fully will be fully alert. And yeah. I don't think they'll get there. John Holmes, I'm surprised that Greece, Crete, and the break of a world war uh, of the WDF didn't make list of Churchill. World War Two initiatives. Well, I have said already done a quite a big mess of a busy on Crete. Um, um, John Holmes didn't stop you doing Force Z in yeah, Altmark, Norway. No, but those ones get less seen as Churchillian marker, uh, Churchillian issues. I've always wondered if O'Connor could have finished the Italians before Rommel got in place. That loss of his forces to Greece. Also, would Germany have committed to Greece if they hadn't felt the British intervention was a threat on their flank? I wouldn't be surprised if they would have still invaded Greece. And on the Connor question, that is an interesting thing to war game. I've seen war games which have shown him win it, and I've seen war games which have shown him not. Well, from Chicago. So really, the old mark isn't the harebrained scheme as much as the mining of Norway was. I would say the late mining of Norway. If they mined all Norway earlier, they might have succeeded. Ricardo Garski, a British guarantee to defend Norway had no credibility after the invasion of Poland. Not really. Honestly, the British guarantee to protect Poland has no, no credibility because the Royal Navy can't reach Poland. They have no land border with Poland. They have nothing that can get to Poland. So in the nicest way, Poland is a is a harebrained scheme, but it's not a Churchill one. You can't protect Poland unless you're prepared to invade from France. The only way you could do the whole invasion thing is if you... Uh, the guarantee of Poland is if you said, you invade Poland, we will, inv we will already have our armies positioned in France, and us and the French will invade from France into Germany. Hitler's, uh, on the other hand, Hitler's lies are pretty reliable to be broken. Churchill fumbles Norway because Churchill's goal is to preserve the empire, not defeating Germany. Um, Ricardo, I think Churchill holds both quite heavily, high, uh, quite highly. I don't think he, re I think in as far as he's concerned, the best way to preserve the empire is to defeat Germany. Churchill does not want to de defeat Germany because he knows Britain can't defeat Germany. Um, only the USA or Russia or both could do that. Britain's the, one of the largest economies in the world. Britain has a far larger military industrial complex than Germany does at this point. Britain has the only fully mechanized, motorized army in the world in 1939. The German one is never. they always flying on horses. Uh, Britain has heavy bombers. Germany doesn't. Britain has a massive fleet compared to the Germans. Whilst Britain fighting a land war in Europe without an ally is rare and frankly unlikely to go through France and etc., Germany, it wouldn't have been a lot. It would have been a long war, but it wouldn't have been a successful one for Germany. Their economy would eventually have been destroyed. That's the British war fight. If you consider how we fought wars and wars in Napoleon, etc., we find a land army to hire, and we tend to supply our own to better strengthen it. It's useful to have allies, but I think in a straight-up war between Germany and Britain, I think Britain still wins. Even Germany and Italy versus Britain, I think eventually Britain and... Because again, it's not a straight-up war versus Britain. You have to remember there's also the Empire backing Britain up. So you're dealing with Canada, Australia, South Africa, India. You're dealing with huge pools of resources, of personnel and industrial capability all there to be called upon. So, no, I, I, I'm sorry. There is a strong theme of history, I know, where there are people who say that, but it's not. And it's like when people go, Britain alone. It, Britain was never alone. It always has the empire at the very least and has all the free forces as well. So it's, no, I'm sorry. 
Michael, Hag uh, Michael Hagen Holson. Not a single word about Denmark. If you somehow ho got hold of the Danish airfields, particularly Arbog, then Luftwaffe would not have been able to support any invasion of Norway. Yes, as my answer goes, but then you would have had to defend Denmark, which could only be done if they had both a larger reserve force themselves, and if the Scandinavian nations had all mobilised to an extent and sent an heart brigade each to reinforce the Danish border. Um and basically turned it into a collective defence area, with the British and French probably reinforcing it at some point. <laughs> Michael Hogan Olsen, yes, it would have been almost impossible to defend Denmark, particularly since both Denmark and Norway had not spent any money on their military. I was just curious if Church UK had any thoughts of securing Dokumark, to prevent it from being used by the Germans as a stepping stone. It would also have helped on a blockade of Germany, as they would have had lost access to all the food that we produced in Denmark. Anyway, I guess you had to prioritise your time, so the video did not get too long. Great video, by the way. Thank I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Honestly, the Danish airfields, you have to remember these days, most airfields are quite complicated systems, and if you place some explosives, you can deny them to the enemy for a good few days. Airfields at that time were quite a lot, you could have a nice flat strip of land, and that would serve as your airfield. So um, it's a slightly different scenario, and that's the problem, really. But if the Danish airfields had, for whatever reason, been put out of commission for a while before, so the Germans couldn't make use of them in Norwegian operations, it would have been a major cramp in their, in their operating capabilities and would have caused them a lot of problems. <laughs> it's fun. Right. For Z. Or Z. I don't like saying force. Uh, I don't like saying force C, but I'll explain why in a second. Now. <sighs> Z. Now, I say Z because Force Z sounds like Force C, which sounds weird to me. It sounds like I'm saying either C or S-E-A. And I don't like that. So I go with Force Z. I know people are going to tell me that's the American, not the Queen's English. I know, I know, I don't care. It just sounds weird to my ears to say Force C. Okay, so... I'm sorry, it just does. Now, there are a lot of questions here. John Hart, a good idea with sustainable air cover. Well, that's pretty much what I focused on. Um, Sean B, does one say Force Z, like our colonial cousins, or Force Z, as one's tutor used to say, from a former lieutenant? Uh, Bijan replies, just use both, and I explained my reason earlier. I know, that's right. An aircraft carrier that doesn't want to use an airplane is sort of useless. There are a few in the history. Now, the armoured carriers coming along fast and not being paused will presumably have implications for the Ministry of Aircraft Production decisions in 1940 about what aircraft to focus on, perhaps giving greater priority to something decent to fly carriers. If only knew someone with a PhD in naval history focused on interwar naval aircraft in the UK. Yes, that is my PhD. Uh, John Evans, the numbers are still going to be reasonably low compared to the output of Spitfires and Hurricanes as well as Militants. True. But, and it's not going to increase it that much. I would, wouldn't be surprised if any air group... Let's put it this way. If they're of indomitable type, and that's what got out there, or one of the uh, sort of the indefatigables, etc. get out there. Let's say it has 48 to... 60 aircraft on it. I would not be surprised if you still found 24 of them to be TSRs, probably Albacores. I would also not be surprised if you found the rest, especially post Mediterranean experience, to be comprised of a mixture of Fulmars and Sea Hurricanes. The former taking on some of the reconnaissance duties from the Albacores, but also providing a measure of air defense, and the latter providing 
some of the a uh, large a uh, large chunk of the elephants, and that would probably have been enough. Again, the forces which attack force Z, uh, Z are B five M's and B six M's. They're Bet uh, Nels and Betty's, I think, from memory. Those are, and they're bombers. They're exactly what they face in the Mediterranean, and it's well known. Ch uh, Cunningham says you need at least eighteen fighters. In an air group. If you therefore had 36 fighters, even if they were 18 were full miles and 18 were hurricanes, sea hurricanes, that would be more than enough to provide the air defense. Dan Freeman, about 24 minutes. 4C was, has only just arrived at Singapore, and Prince of Wales went into dry, uh, dock for maintenance. Repulse had started to potter off to visit Australia, Australia. The issue is the timing. They had, arrived, had they arrived a week earlier, or the Japanese attacked a week later, they might well not have been present at all, but the Japanese did attack. They had to deploy a sortie. That is the trouble. They should have been based at a salon when they wouldn't have done. Vision, will you attack, sir? Attack? Attack where? There. Where? There, my lord. This is your enemy. There are your guns. The Light Brigade will advance. Mm hmm. My lord, sir, you have lost the Light Brigade. I have what? I will not be blamed. Some must be blamed, for someone has blundered. True. Light Brigade is a classic example of it. Anyway. Thomas Rottweiler. So what did Churchill learn from World War I? The greatest threat to the UK survival came from U-boats. In 1939, there was no German high seas fleet, no proper battleships, and none likely a couple of years. Uh, for a couple, a couple of years. RNS-7 aircraft carriers in 1939, Germany none. Delaying critical capital ship construction at the start of war made sense in view of who the UK was actually awarded. Clearly, if Rear Admiral Hindsight had been in charge, priorities would be different, but he wasn't. Guy R. Hindsight seems an utterly British name. I had to read it aloud to get it. Dug in. But the Italians did ha have proper battleships, and while they did not have a carrier, they had home turf and land based air force. So those extra carriers are needed in the med of nothing else. And then there's me. Plus, those carriers are needed for anti submarine warfare work. Remember, RNASW doctrine included carrier led hunter groups. Hence my point. Battleships make sense. But the carriers being stopped is an old war thinking. It was neither justifiable in the ASW grounds or the likelihood of war in the Mediterranean. Plus, they were critical to the anti surface raider groups worldwide. All the key areas of naval warfare, as seen in 1939, needed carriers, and more carriers were needed as agreed by the whole Admiralty. Also, as I mentioned before, those escort programs, particularly the flower class and trawler programs, were started in 1938, and they weren't built in the big yards that built carriers. Carriers and battleships were stopped because they thought they need to use fitting out yards as repair yards, which they did, but by no means to the level feared that had been used to justify the decision. Ben Wilson, I agree with you. The Iron failed to provide sufficient support to Atlantic convoys until early in 1941. Many merchant ships went solo, increasing losses. Many merchant ships, uh, their, their crew and... Uh, their crew and cargo were lost. The lost ships had to be replaced to Britain needed supplies. They were built in British shipyards, not something in some uh, in someone who only looks at Royal Navy with sea. There may be different yards, but close to the other yards, building destroyers, merchant ships, like, they require the same building skills. Like, I'm sure they thought that it was thought of. Yes, but not as much as you'd think. And it looks like, but unless workers and equipment manufacturers, all the supply chains are left doing nothing. Whatever they're doing instead, well, the workers in the yards were moved to the fitting out spots. They weren't missing and moved from these dockyards. They didn't go, oh, you're all who are working at the Vickers and Camelettes will now go work in these other yards. No, um, they would work at other ships probably in the yards, but not on those slipways. And again, they come back quite well. When they, uh, when they freed them up very quickly once they decided to restart it. Whatever they're doing, instead would be getting uh, would be getting done much later without qualifying and quantifying what it was. It does not seem plausible to fairly criticise this. On the other hand, British should still have had glorious and courageous, and there is maybe a better place to lay criticism, even though with hindsight. By the way, who exactly authorised in the Admiralty glorious going independently? No one in the Admiralty. It was Cork and Ori. All right. I just don't get it. And, and and there's Ark Royal as well, which is lost due to... And someone says uh, more carriers, I think, later, and I'm talking this, more carriers equals more chance for admirals to... Uh, captains to make mistakes. And again, there is one captain. And yes, there is one captain. And in the nicest way, all navies have problems with captains of carriers at the beginning of World War Two because captains... Uh, carriers are still a new thing. Working out what to do with them in war... And so is naval aviation, and 
well, the captain of Ark Royal it tries to correct the decisions made by his damage control officer, not too much success. Um, the captains uh, of the other ships, captains of Courageous, he was doing what he was ordered to, hunting submarines. That's what he was ordered. That was the doctrine. They needed a carrier for it. Now, in reality, he should have probably had a carrier like Hermes or Eagle doing that, I something... Or Argus, even something slightly expendable. You don't want to lose it, but one which, if you lose, no one's going to be crying too much about it. But they weren't available, and the thing the carriers that are available are the big fleet carriers. And you need the construction, and everyone was telling them, "No, we need the construction," but they weren't listening. Vision, you have failed me for the last time, Captain. Command appeared. Get an, uh, our own umbrella up, back up now. Yeah, go back those destroyers. Stop chasing subs. You're in command now of this carrier, Captain Peart. Thank you, Lord Vader. Yeah. Basically, the idea I think that's come from is my point of if it had been the admirals which have been converted to carriers, not the courageous, not courageous, glorious, and furious, uh, if those had provided the two big ships or the three, the three big carriers and furious we got rid of, they would have been sufficiently big enough that they would have automatically been admiral's commands. They would automatically be seen as large task force center ships with large air groups. And again, you you might risk a ship with a captain on it, but a ship with an admiral on it is not going to be out hunting a submarine. And a ship with an admiral on it is also not going to be, we are going to sail independently without escorts, and oh, we're not going to have air groups up. And the admiral will probably turn around to the captain and go, and you came up with this idea entirely by yourself? How good. Goodbye. It is interesting to note that as uh, the British carrier doctrine is evolving, and there is actually carrier doctrine which requires, that does like admirals, uh, admirals to be present. And it's one of the things that in the Mediterranean, even when they only have one carrier, there's often a rear admiral aircraft carriers aboard that carrier. That is the thing. That's what... Cunning was relying on. And they have a rear admiral aircraft carriers in the home fleet. So, and this is, these, these boats developed in the 1930s. If you'd had bigger carriers, you would have probably had a vice admiral aircraft carriers. In which case, there would also have been a rear admiral aircraft carriers. And yes, whilst not every carrier might have had an admiral board, if you do have admirals around who are in charge of aircraft carriers, and someone tries to wander off with their uh, with an aircraft carrier without their permission. They tend to get very testy about it, incredibly so. Whiskey Tango Sierra, uh, here was the answer. Here was that question I was talking about earlier. Then again, if those ships had been completed so much earlier, they may well have simply given the Admiralty a chance to put more incompetence in as captain and gotten sunk. One captain. I'm sorry, Whiskey. One captain. You cannot say the rest are incompetence, and in fact. As a rule, Royal Navy captains do just as well, if not slightly better, arguably, uh, ship for ship, in the initial run. So, yeah, you have one captain. And unfortunately, he has bad luck, or rather the Royal Navy has bad luck that he makes the decision at the wrong time. Well, then there's a nice discussion between John Evans and Lillard. And John Evans, isn't there a theory that Glorious was actually detached to conduct an airborne mining operation flying across Norway to Sweden when she was lost? Lillard, sure there is, and I would guess you started it. Look, you mean that when the Germans are going to win Norway, evacuation from there is underway, France is being overrun, and it is at this point where Britain decides, yes, let's violence Sweden's neutrality in exchange for getting a few dozen at best mines into the Baltic Sea? John Evans then had to go look where I saw it. I think I read it in time, but the pay gated but found another piece and originated original author's website well ropes age was glorious the cover-up of churchill's operation paul illib it is an interesting article however it turns out the files that were considered secret were already cleared there was nothing relevant to paul there so without some substance i don't think it considers it considers merit anymore and after reading that i still don't have a clue what could anyone think that operation would possibly help even if the mentioned 18 mines would be dropped into the narrow channel so each navy did have minesweepers. So what? Maybe one ship lost, and that would have caused troubles for iron shipments. 
just doesn't help. The fact that Paul is no longer mentioned after evacuation of Norway seems to make sense to be related to the fact that Norway and Germany in hand, Paul would have been lost, uh, have lost even the minimal possibility of some effect it had previously. And yes, Churchill was kind of mad at sometimes, but he was not insane. John Evans. I guess that thought was the one ship lost would block the channel for a period of times. Illib. If the sea is so shallow, you can block it with one ship. How do you prevent the sea mines from being found out? And it's not likely any substantial ships were passing through there. For that matter, I tried to find some free navigation tool with sea depth allowing for the area, but failed to do so this far. But at least ships nearly 10 meters draft can get in the harbor these days. But of course, that does not mean it was the same back then. But even so, with the loss of Narvik, it would be pointless. That is the point about Operation Paul. I agree. The RN loses free carriers for no sane reason. But honestly, it shouldn't have stopped building its carriers either. It shouldn't have lost those carriers, and it should have been building carriers. And if you think about that, if it had not, if it had better damage control in Ark Royal, they'd done what they were supposed to do according to manual. Ark Royal wouldn't have been lost, and would have been probably possibly available for, for uh, to go out to the Far East. If they'd been more sensible, and it hadn't been courageous out hunting some marines, she wouldn't have been lost. If they'd basically gone, right, yes, our doctrine is this, but the only vessel we have is a fleet carrier, and we don't have that many of them, so no, we're not sending her out for an anti-submarine hunt, especially not in those waters. And if Glorious had... If someone sane had intervened and go, no, you don't go off on your own. You wait for a battleship, or you wait for a battle cruiser, or you wait for a cruiser force. Because again, if you were with a cruiser force, and if there is an admiral present going, are you flying an air patrol? These things don't happen. In fact, in nicest way, if Scharnhorst and Neisenauer get spotted by an air patrol from Glorious, who has a pack of cruisers with her, as well as some, destroy uh, some destroyers then probably she's immediately signalling for battleships to come in and battle cruisers and whichever in the area to rush up. And more importantly, those cruisers probably go, Ooh, hunting time! Let's get close and into torpedo range while airstrikes are being launched. It's just not a fun scenario for channels there. So anything sensible would have made, made sure the RN pretty much had three more carriers and arguably could have had as many as seven more carriers in service than it actually did by the time of this, which meant there could have been one, maybe two carriers out with 4Z. And that's the point. Would they have been two armoured carriers? Possibly. Might they have been an armoured carrier and either glorious or courageous? Quite probably, i.e. one of the older vessels out there as a deterrent with a newer vessel. Probably refitted to an extent. It might have even been Ark Royal and one of the uh, armoured carriers, because you don't want to take Ark Royal into the Mediterranean, and she isn't any use really in the Atlantic uh, once you've got sorted out those things there. So you might well take her and one of the armoured carriers, in which case, if she's there, well, let's, say, let's say with Indomitable with an air group of 60, and she's got her 72, and that becomes quite a hefty strike group and quite a hefty capability, the Japanese start hunting factor, which might actually affect their invasion of Singapore plans. Because if that group is deployed there and they realise that is in the area, then they have to start thinking about significant shipping coming south to support it. John Evans, wasn't the slowing of carriers illustrious class due to loss of supply of Czech armour plate? A cam seventy two. I had something like that, though I didn't know it was Czech armor plate. Not really. Not really. There's a lot of discussion about Czech armor plate, but honestly, the British could supply them quite happily from their own. And it's, again, it's the ASW escorts. They don't really use those things. Steve Winish. Oh uh, wow! Hadn't realized how slow those carry bills were. I suppose all those frigates, corvettes, and other ASW escorts were the reason. Not really. Quite a lot of those frigates, etc. actually started after the carriers are finally completed. As disastrous as Force Z was, um, more convoy sinkings could have been very bad as well, especially if they peaked at the wrong time. It doesn't seem likely that Singapore would have survived anyway. We'll get into that. But again, it ha it, it, it's a different thing. Um, convoy sinkings could have been bad, 
and would have been bad. But actually, there would have been less convoy sinkings if you'd had more carriers available, because some of those carriers could have been used to escort major convoys. That uh, they could have helped bridge the air gap until escort carriers came available. Hashem, armored carriers is smearing his face with paint and donning the headdress. Uh, yes. But, uh, who do you think was, you know, in discussions of him are when we first started really working out. This was during my PhD a long time ago. Looking at the timelines and going, this really doesn't make sense. And let's look at the reasons used for justifying this. And actually, we knocked them all down. And it comes back to, it's the old style thinking. It's not actually justifiable. 20th July, 1944. Right. The fleet should have stayed in Ceylon exactly like the US Pacific fleet should have stayed in San Diego, like Admiral Richardson wanted. And for exactly the same reasons you articulated. Ben Wilson. Comparing Trim Connolly with San Diego is pointless. Trim Connolly was basically an anchorage on the other side of the world from Britain, with no easy access to repair, maintenance, supplies, or manpower. Instead of San Diego, substitute Manus Island. Actually... Uh... Uh, to an extent, I agree with you, but Trim Connolly actually does have some put support. The British do manage to send out things to there. So, yeah, it could have been interesting. And again, it could have been interesting if you hadn't paused carrier construction, because you would have had, as I said, carriers, which might meant you'd have had Let's put it this way. Let's, uh, let's put nothing. Let's say you have a pair of carriers operating together at some points in the Mediterranean because you have the increased carriers in service. That might well reduce your losses in Crete, etc., if you have a pair of carriers available. Because you would have that many more fighters, that many more spares, that bit large, such a larger force. It becomes that much more sustainable. Scalability is more sustainable. Again, did not know Churchill Paul's aircraft carrier construction. Seriously shocked. Yep. Wayne Boren. Oh, yeah. And Abda with teeth. Well, yes. If you'd had. Let's say Wolf C doesn't get attacked. Uh, survives. And they do have a carrier with them. Then. That Abda probably gets forced around for. Uh, formed around Fort C. So you suddenly have those cruisers, whatever escorts extra that they, they have with Fort C. And. Carriers and battle uh, and Prince of Wales and Repulse. That becomes a very scary force for the Japanese to deal. They're going to have to send a major force to deal with it. They might still do it, but it's going to be a major force, and it's going to be a British-led force, which means, in the nicest way, it's probably likely going to be more coherent, because if it's a British admiral on the ta on the uh, on a task uh, a flagship battleship. He can have a staff where he can get officers from the different navies together, and different navies together, and so he can make sure the communications protocols work, that their communications go out. Which Abder itself doesn't really have time or space to organize. John South, I always thought the biggest issue was the lack of light carriers doing the grunt work, not the laser of the fleet carriers. Homie's biggest problem wasn't size or speed or a small air group. But that was only one of them. At 10,850 tons, she was pretty much bang on the Washington Mount to be just another cruiser. And shaving maybe a not another speed and a couple hundred miles could have brought her under 10,000 tons if needed. In terms of capability, she is comparable, but slightly better than the escort carriers in mid to late war, like the attack class. If in the 1920s, I, between Washington and London, they built more of them, the UK could easily have built at least 10 to 15 of them. And to be honest, the spending would have worked wonders on the British economy during the period. The UK could have had a solid force of escort carriers for any submarine warfare and support work, meaning Courageous and Glorious would have been nowhere near the submarines and carriers like Elon Ark Royal might not have been wasted on resupply runs to Malta. Thus giving the RN a much better capability in preserving her fleet carriers for other work. Uh, it would have been quite likely the force at Denmark Strait had also had a carrier attached to it, and thus not only would Admiral Holland not have lost, con lost contact, he could have been used in the build-up of the battle, and making loss uh, loss of. Um, it could have been used in loss of uh, in the build of battle, making loss of hood very unlikely. It's also quite likely that the nineteen like the, that like nineteen forty two like fleet carrier program, the Dominions and AK Canada and Australia and possibly New Zealand would probably have purchased one each. New Zealand and Australia both bought cruisers from the UK in this period. In this case, it is perfectly plausible that each of the cruiser groups hunting German raiders in nineteen twenty nine could have had a light carrier in the mix, which would have made life very difficult for ships like the Grass Bay. With the uh, what the RN needed to do was clearly define two main types of carriers: fleet carrier and light carriers. Light carriers being used for patrol and resupply work, and the fleet carriers being used for major engagements. And Hermes was pretty much perfect for light carrier role. 
Although, if I was having a group of 10 to 12 Hermes class carriers, uh, if I was having a group of 10 to 12 Hermes class carriers, I'd be tempted to have their air group be exclusively made of skewers. As away from land based fighters, their multi role capabilities, both a fighter and die bomb, makes them a logical choice as they maximize your capability at any one time while being flexible. As if your main threat is long range bombers like the Condor, you have a potential cap of 20 planes. If you're smacking down a service road in the South Atlantic, you don't need a cap, and 20 die bombs is more than enough. Victor Yao, this would make a great uh, for a great alternative history. 1939 UK with dozens of light escort carriers makes the Battle of the Atlantic a lot easier for the Royal Navy and Commonwealth more harder for the Kriegsmarine. Very true. And it's an interesting idea. And I would argue, actually, and I do with my PhD thesis, although I don't think people can read it yet, um, it might be turned into a book soon. You never know. I'll have a talk with Pen and Sword. Hopefully after this, they might, after the travel's out, they might consider it. Uh, basically, the RN develops a doctrine of free carrier types, what I call the cruiser carrier, which is for escort, that sort of work, and it's the light carrier, the battle carrier for fleet work, and the strike carrier. And these are to fit within the tonnage limitations of the Washington and the London Naval Treaties, because ideally, what they would, the strike and the battle carrier would be combined into a fleet carrier. And then the cruiser carrier would be a light fleet carrier or light carrier, which could also jump up into those roles in a limited way. Because that's the ideal RN idea, but they can't on the treaty limitations. They can't build a carrier they want to keep close enough to the battle fleet to provide the air support and the strike the battle fleet needs without giving it armor for fighting in the training. But that, if it's got armor, it isn't going to, isn't going to have enough air group to be a strike for a strike role. And either way, that's going to be so. Bit of those ships are going to be so weighty. You aren't going to be bold enough to do the cruiser roll. So yeah, if there had been a definition of a light fleet carrier and etc. in the treaties, which would be an interesting idea, and I would love to actually war game that. Perhaps you define treaties as sort of. Um, Let's say you define it as 15,000 tons. Let's say treaty, instead of defi uh, defines these things, capital ship limitations as 45,000 tons, um, carrier, fleet carrier 30,000 tons, light fleet carrier 15,000 tons. And let's say Navy is limited to uh, Britain and America. That I'm gonna, if I'm gonna completely jump off history, I might as well make it easy for myself. Limited to 20 battleships. That makes it easy for me to work out maths because then Japan's, if they're on a 7 to 10 ratio, I'm limited to 14. Uh, let's say they limit them to 10 fleet carriers and 10 light fleet carriers. So you're allowed to build 300,000 tons of fleet carrier and 150,000 tons of light fleet carrier and 900,000 tons of battleship and that's your force and so then Japan be sevenths of that seven tenths of that that could be an interesting scenario to see what would come out well, that would have been an interesting scenario. That would be a very interesting scenario, especially for people like the Kriegsmarine, etc. Because if the Royal Navy has 10 light fleet carriers and is able to have had 10 fleet carriers before World War II, uh, you have a very, very different scenario. There again, 20, 45,000 ton battleships would be quite cool. <laughs> Have a passe. In hindsight, there was the Great Depression. It had been dampening investments in all capital projects since 1929, compounded by restrictive naval treaties since 1921, which at the time seemed to serve the British interests in limiting expenditures. Unfortunately, the construction of the arms industry into war by lack of orders meant that the specialized industrial infrastructure for heavily armored wartime staples was not as easy and not as easily had as when dreadnoughts one year building time from 95 was remarkable, but not so typical. It was a very different, less UK-friendly world that saw the Second World War started by two powerful adversaries at opposite corners of the world. Very different from the First World War, and less able and prepared England for the challenge. Mm, yeah, agreed. Uh, it would have been interesting if World War Two had started, as I said often. It's, if you t put it back a couple of years, you get a very different circumstance, at least from the Royal Navy's perspective. 
Have a fast day. Of course, again, uh, let's not forget the manpower shortage during no small parts of the capitula capitulation of England's allies by 1940. England was alone pre Pearl Harbor. Just lend lease and FDR's goodwill was all that Churchill could count on until Force C had been destroyed ostensibly due to lack of air cover several days after Pearl Harbor. Nevertheless, there was British Air Air Force in the region where Force C was operating. Obviously, they could have been better coordinated and likely were expected to provide air cover. However, the radio silence and state of utter confusion as the IJN attacked after the 4C mission was underway, coincided with 4C's sudden arrival at the worst moment. Um, Martinat was, well, there was also Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, the rest of the Commonwealth Empire, all the various free forces. Britain was alone, but very much with friends at the same time. But also the vast majority of those first half of the war escort vessels were crewed through existing reserves. I would say, as I've pointed out in other videos about 4C, that the issue when it comes to coordination is if they'd had an aircraft carrier already with them and coordinating air, air cover that would have made it far easier to actually coordinate with land-based air cover as well so that's the thing you have an aircraft carrier there operating fighters you're probably going to have a force multiplier of land-based fighters coming out to assist as well that's the fun Hello. I'm not sure, but I think the point is not about crewing ships, but about dockyard workers and workers in the supply trains. French workforce had pretty much lost the Allies, and while French Free French Navy was welcome, it also meant more than minor British support workforce, and the output of various Commonwealth nations was not really great, I don't want to believe. You're to an extent true, but also, remember all those points we often make about French dockyards. They are very problematic to run, they weren't really expected to provide a lot of support, and the Canadians were ramping up fast. Australians took a fair bit longer, but the Canadians had far more population and were able to use it. Bill Wilson, I have read but cannot prove the movement. A moment of Force Z to Singapore was a result of conversations with FDR, who wanted to move parts of the US fleet to the Philippines as one is Japanese. FDR then moved the fleet to Hawaii and promised to send huge numbers of B-17s to the Philippines, most of which did not happen. Not really, but there's to an extent. It's a more British strategy. Uh, Potter ending game. I'm so pleased with myself, Doc. When you said Gallipoli was a badly executed good idea, I argued that to my high school history teacher, but he didn't agree. Eh. Paul from Chicago. Lessons from World War One. modern people don't pick up on is, uh, is the usefulness of trawlers. Basically, tuna turn fishing boats into submarine hunters for escort duties. Post-war, sell them to fishermen and tank the small boat in the building industry and the process collapses. Uh, actually, remember, the small boat industry has to convert all those ships from their wartime configuration to a peacetime fishing configuration, also finish their engines. So, yes, the building section tends to not be happening, but they get a lot of money for conversion work, so it doesn't tank the industry quite. But expanding that into whalers, cable of transatlantic crossings was literally brilliant. Sometimes it's nice to see the axes weren't the only ones expanding on the lessons from World War One. True. Richard Gray, it would be interesting to see a work of just how many escorts they thought they would get from the halting capital ship construction for each type, as well as how many they actually did get. I've always read that the skimping on small ship production in favour of capital ships, then prioritising them once war, war broke out, was a long-standing policy due to peacetime budgets. While I agree with hindsight that carriers would not have been great, just how many destroyers does it cost to get them? If you're prioritising carriers over tribals, Dr. Clark, then I must say I'm expected to wow. The tribals were all built by this point. They're not building tribals. And again, they, they well, they're building some for the Canadians and Australians, but that, they're not building tribals for the Royal Navy. And again, I cannot emphasize this much. Stopping the carriers was against British doctrine. It was done to make an impact. And I often, you have to remember, part of the war is psychological. And one of the reasons we've come up with for the stopping is the carriers is that it shows the government's commitment to building escorts, which is important for the insurance and important for the convoy confidence. But honestly, stopping the battleships makes sense. Stopping the es uh, aircraft carriers, not really. Because, as said, those aircraft carriers, they provide they could fill in the air gap there's all sorts of things that they are important for anti submarine warfare operations and as said those losses could have been made good quite quickly so even if we had lost the free carriers we'd have still had enough in service that force z would not have been out there without a carrier john evans the pause in construction does not help in terms of slipways unless you clear the unfinished hull out so it is a manpower issue or one of materials such as HT steel, plating and framing. Doesn't seem like a switch to escorts would have been much bearing on your arm valve as they really don't carry much. No. So it's not that. And for the battleships... 
in, it's not even engine manufacturers, because believe it or not, the people who build the large engines for battleships are not the same factories which build the smaller engines for destroyers. Victor, yeah. if I had a time machine, I'm hauling you back in, in front of some Royal Navy arrow, Admirals. War will be over faster. We can hope. John McCarley, interesting, but what fighters would an iron armor carriers have on board in Southeast Asia? FAA full miles? How could they have fared against Zeros? I get this question, but I did respond. At this point in 1941, they would probably have been had Sea Hurricanes and full miles, possibly a squadron of both. Not great. Basically, I'm basing that on a... Standard illustrious class hull. In that they could probably accommodate 48. If pushed by this point. Not great, but enough to break up the air attacks, especially as the aircraft hitting them were G3M Nels and G4M Bettys. So I was right. Um, you also have to remember the radar and control systems British have built up with naval fighter direction. Those could have enabled the fighters to position themselves to best suit their needs. And for foreseeing on that day in particular, the full Mars will not have faced zeros. This is from Subanshi in 1990. All they needed to do was disrupt the Japanese bomber formations and attack runs as they were able to Mediterranean on multiple occasions. Pretty much that's it. You don't need a lot of aircraft to disrupt an air attack. The whole point is, if you break up the air attack, then the ship can has a better chance of dodging any torpedoes that are running on it, and it's a better chance of its own guns being able to concentrate. You can't overwhelm the air defences if your attacks are being broken up from a long range out. Plus, some pilots will turn around, some will drop their bombs early, all sorts of things because of the fighters engaging them. It has an impact. It has a morale impact. And more importantly, if they've got a car if they've got a cap up, they've probably got radar operating, so they see the enemy coming from a long way away, which gives them warning, which means they have all their air defenses and everything else popped up. And you're probably not operating a mission silence. If you've got radar and fighter cap of your own, you're probably integrating and working with the land-based air cover. So you're calling up land-based fighters as well. So you could have a very successful air defense going on there. And it could actually have ruined the Japanese bomber force, which could have had impacts later on in the war. Hmm. Goodness gracious me. That's... Uh... Force Z took a long time. I thought it was going to. Now, on to Italy. <laughs> the soft underbelly. Mm -hmm. Right then. Rick, uh, Ricardo Kowalski. Mediterranean. Italy, Crete, Malta, Suez, Gibraltar was the soft underbelly of the British Empire. Churchill was shrewdly talking about Britain's weakness and his own fears. I know I have disagreed with your earlier point about, about Nor or you said about Norway and Britain versus Germany, but I do agree with this one. Suez was a big problem for Britain because it was out to control the Mediterranean and the access through to Suez, it takes a lot longer to reach the Empire in the Far East. Mediterranean is a critical point. There's a reason the Royal Navy maintains such a large fleet there at all times. But if they can't run through it because of the war with Italy, that's the issue. Sherwood, I agree fully that a major benefit, one claimed at a time, according to Churchill's World War II memoirs, was to open a Mediterranean safely to, tra to traffic to, be uh, to the Suez Canal and on to India, and not explicitly to operations beyond Singapore and the Pacific. There's also certain benefits from drawing off German forces from the Eastern Front, from the Curse Battle. Uh, the questions to me are, one, was Churchill's objective in Italy the Lubajana Gap to the, get the Allied armies into Eastern Europe? And two, why were Allied landings after Sicily limited to the south, the boot in the Salerno? Remember that Kessler expected that, and he was right, but Rommel, in terms of operation in the and beyond, was worried about attacks on Sardinia and possibly Corsica to be followed by landings once the Allies had air supremacy, from new airfields on the Mediterranean islands in the north to cut off German forces in Italy and open the way for movements across the Alps into France, Germany, and Austria. Raise a look up. Along your line, Stuart, my particular thoughts and questions are about how much the Italian front was also a need to let the American industrial base get ramped up more, see if Russia was st stabilizing on the rust of and southern ends, and finally, as if in the Africa campaign, how much was about getting more experience for the American Anzac Canadian ground troops? 
especially in consideration of a fake southern France potential invasion versus actual normally. How about part of the actual accurate prediction? Uh, how about part of an accurate prediction for Italian invasion lulled Germany into a full sense of confidence in Nice or Narbonne expectations? So much to consider. Thanks for your points. Basically, it's complicated. There are lots of benefits considered. Some are realized, some aren't. It's, as said, Italy is about the wider war strategy. It's not really a sensible invasion point, but it does help. But, as Hannibal would tell you, it's easier to fight from the north of Italy to the south than from the south to the north. See you Windish. Very nice video. Once Sicily fell, the idea of the sewers being in danger is over for good. Mm, aircraft are not that short ranged. Uh, the Italians got a separate piece soon after Sicily, after the British had invaded Italy. Uh, but even if they had not, the issue, well, the British and the American allies had invaded Italy, then Italy surrenders. There could no longer reasonably be Egypt. Uh, the Italian Navy had their chances of Italy. If they were going to come out and play, they would have then. Mm, they were preparing to, but they didn't have the fuel. They were preparing to when the invasion of Italy happened, and it was only the surrender, which they then used the fuel they were preparing to go in. Unfortunately, the large majority of casualties happened on the Italian mainland. The argument for a minor second front for Stan's benefit is the only one that would make any real sense for Salerno and later Anzio. But then again, considering Churchill and every other ally, including Uncle June, knew a real second front was coming soon, it seems that having a diversion in Italy which ties up far fewer German resources than Allied resources makes less and less sense. The only other possible reason would be if the Italian fascists somehow held on to power in the aftermath of Sicily and they needed a final push to fall. Even then, it could have been a limited campaign in scope with half the resources given it, and far fewer casualties because they would not be doing constant assaults in horrible terrain. I never understood why the British complained about the relatively small numbers of the infantry available normally, while divisions and lives were being squandered in Italy all the way up to spring 1945. Uh, well, I'd say not one day complain because complaining covers the fact that they were off doing something else. Uh, Crazy Locker. Coffee mugs blue or orange for your own fake iron brew experience bonus. Mmm, tempting. Might try. I, I, I'm considering that sort of thing. And now for questions. As Stuart Parshi goes into, and along lines of the video presentation, how much of Churchill's World War I experience with Gallipoli and the threats of the Ottoman Empire, combined with what Hitler was attempting along the now Croatian Mediterranean coast all the way across the Black Sea towards southern Russia and modern Armenia, fueled this perspective on Italy being soft spot? Certainly understand a lot more of the need to get through the sewers, and if Greece and Italy are both secured, if Russia falls in the southern end, uh, does Churchill have to face Gallipoli 2.0? Trying to figure out time frame decisions and effects of current Soonish active battles in context of this set of crap for videos has been wearing out my library card. Just returned the abridged memoirs of Churchill. Unfortunately, I have a full set available. Greatly appreciate the mental expansion you're providing along with World War II YouTube channel and, of course, Drac and Jamie. More! More will be coming. It's, the answer is for Italy is it's complicated. The Allies would love to secure the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is important. And it's not just also, and this is going to sound strange, from the perspective of freeing up the Mediterranean from the British perspective to get their supplies out to the Far East. Think about where the major Canada and Canadian infrastructure is. Think about where the major American infrastructure is. Think about the war going on in Southeast Asia in the Philippines. If you can bring, instead of taking the stuff by train across America, Loading on the ships on the on the west coast, then taking across the Pacific, south, as far south as you can go, to Australia, and then having to come up. That takes time. That all that's a lot of connections, a lot of things which have to move, and a lot of complications. If you can load it straight onto ships on the east coast, take it straight across the Atlantic through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, into the Indian Ocean, and straight to where they need to be dropped off in Southeast Asia, that's gonna speed it up. And it's all about the fight. It's all about the long-term war in the Pacific. So that's what the British used to really get the Americans on side. Uh, get the uh, Americans on side. And there's also there is the fact that as you are sort of considering, possibly using the Dardanelles as another supply route to start supplying Russia. They're already going up through Iran.
Doug M. Well, your ma when your main allies fixated on the one big push idea and care nothing about anything else, uh, tough to get decent execution. Doug M. The Italian campaign is nothing but an attempt by the Brits to re-establish its pre-war imperial, imperial status. And more about actually linking up their empire. Samuel Thompson. Sicily, yes. South of France, absolutely yes. Both give the Allies ample air and sea bases. Italian mainland after Rome surrendered? Absolutely no. Well, let's see. The invasion of Italy takes place on the 3rd of September. The armistice of Cassibel, signed between the Kingdom of Italy and the Allies during World War II, takes place on the 3rd of September, is made public on the 8th of September. And it's signed by Major General Walter Bedelsmith for the Allies and Brigadier General Giuseppe Castello for Italy at a conference of generals in, at the Allied military camp in Cassibel in Sicily. Now, the thing is, the invasion is part of that. And that's part of the requirements to try and get and secure that. And yes, it's not exactly easy. You're invading Rome at the same time as you're getting the surrender from Italy. And the idea, the hope was actually you could quickly advance through Italy, I think. You know, when Italy surrenders not long after the invasion, they were already pushing, pushing them out, really. And they do a ceasefire. The idea was that the British would and the American troops would surge through Italy and catch the Germans on the hop. It doesn't happen. It's a nice idea, but it doesn't happen. Uh, it's just, yeah. <laughs> the train of infantry campaigning from the south north was fated to uh, devour infantry like trenches World War One. Yes. Uh, considering the enormous expense of lives, mineral returns of investments, and the fact the Allies never got past Italy in nearly two years, the campaign that follows this was pure folly. It violated Western Allies' commitment to minimizing casualties. Unlike Stalin on the Eastern Front, Stalin did not care, but Roosevelt and Churchill usually did, except in Italy, pure folly. What can I say? They hoped it would work. They had ideas, but... Good ideas, poorly executed, or crackpot schemes is the whole point of this. And I would say the invasion of Italy is a good idea, poorly executed, because you do need to invade Italy to an extent if you're doing... But I would have been... This is going to sound strange. If I'm negotiating with the Italians and they're going to launch a ceasefire, a secret ceasefire, I would have been arriving far further north I would have been marching straight to reinforce them in Rome, but I wouldn't have marched into Rome. There are all sorts of things you could have done differently. Ramona, 19, uh, Ramona 14, 14 20, 220. I never looked at the Italian campaign in regards to Japan. Hope you have now. Hi, Rick Vassal. Hi, Doctor. What you have said makes so much more sense. I just thought it was about the Middle East oil. I've also read where many, uh, where many senior military American thought it was about the saving the empire, too. Hmm. It's about actually being able to fight for the empire. Wayne Boren, that's the first time an exploration in an Italian campaign made sense. Well, wow, thanks for opening my mind a bit further. All helped by Italy's inability to manufacture ammunition to standard, which meant they missed consistently. If they had British quality ammo, the Mediterranean would have been a lot bloodier. Yep. Strub, Doctor, I got to thinking that from something you said in the video, how a British economy react to another year of war? Would it have reduced the post-war slump? Potentially. Glenn McGillivray, um, hmm, neutral Italy, so no bomb bases. Germany would want Greece and Cyprus, uh, also want to steal Sicily. British could send Anzacs there, as well as Indian troops. So Greek mountains become the new Italian campaign, but at least the Vargo shops get, uh, get through. Meanwhile, the carriers would remain important to support the front as British runways. 
get bombed, shelled, and power, power dropped by lads with satchels or explosives on a regular basis. With the train, I doubt they would make push uh, progress through the mountains. No war in Russia and no panicking Frenchmen. There would be more, more order than in France. With cruisers, tanks would have to avoid coastlines. Um, how well the Anzacs, BF, Indians, and Navy would do in Greece under the persistent German assault is uncertain. But if allies desperate to follow British leadership instead of crumbling French concepts, it would have been a more interesting to feel the battle. Hmm. I suspect the Germans would do well till their supplies ran low, and so the British would have to persuade Russia to stop selling oil and figure out how to persuade the Turks to grant passage so they could liberate Romanian oil. Sounds like a fun war game. Oh, the, and that, uh, on the unlikely event you want to, uh, to reply, Mr. Clark, doc, Mr. Clark, yeah. Dr. Clark, Mr. Clark. I don't really mind, but... When you put Mr. Clark in lower case, it does sort of... Mm, could be my traditional British perspective. When you take some... Uh, it's like if you're talking to a female academic who's a doctor, and instead of a doctor, you call them Miss, or write Miss with lower case. That's sometimes considered a bit rude. I've never seen someone do it with a male, a male one, though. I'm sure I don't think it was meant to be. I think of the invasion of Japan as an Italian campaign, and at the end of the long logistics train, into a nation, a nation that, rather than kicking out your leadership and fighting under your side to liberate itself, instead tries to arm its civilians and soldiers to fight back for their survival. I suspect firebombing the entire nation would have been the easiest way to defeat Japan. Thankfully, the nukes worked. Alternatively, cut them off from China and blockade them. Sure, the war might go on for two or more decades, but no oil, no fuel, no food, no rubber, Japan would have to sue for peace. And while the war continues, the soldiers can go home, only the Navy needs to sustain her duty. And we might have gone super carriers World War II flavor. With jet fighters scrapping with Japanese kamikaze, till the Soviet Union decides to claim Germany for itself. Hmm, some interesting ideas there. Felix Sweet. So I guess you would include the Dan and the Dakinese campaign in this video, but what about the proposed Balkan invasion? I thought the issue is Churchill does not recognize mountains on maps. Mm, to be honest, I'm starting to consider that with some of the, uh, one of some of the events. Maldoroy. As long as fascist Italy was in the war, it needed dealing with. Allies had experienced troops, planes, ships, act, and theatre within, within easy striking distance of Sicily, so attacking that was a no-brainer. Then it's on to the mainland. All of Mussolini's government took southern Italy out of the war, but the industrial heartlines remained under German control. One could say both allies and Germans kept feeding troops and material in, keeping the others from taking their country. Even if the Suez Canal didn't exist, the Italian campaign would need to have been fought. I doubt it. If the Suez Canal didn't exist, the British wouldn't have cared about the metro at all. They'd have locked it up with Gibraltar. Soft underbelly phrase was just a bit of Churchillian rhetoric, not to be taken too seriously. Uh, Jones, totally agree. Uh, back of my mind is saying that I remember someone stating opening the Med added a million tons a month to British supply capacity, but can't be sure on it. Be interested if someone has a figure of the source. That would sound about right to me, but it might be wrong. Richard Gray, wonderful discussion of the realities, and I have a question at the end of this. I would go a step further and say that Italy was the soft underbelly from a political standpoint, though obviously not a military one. The speed with which the fascist government collapses should be proof of that. The removal of the Italian order of battle and installation of liberated Italian government justifies it all, even without the strategic east-west concerns. The problem becomes that we then have a morale imperative to liberate the rest of Italy. That's the truth. So here's my non-patron, sorry, fixed income question laid out in respect to the series as a whole. Richard, as I said before, I am very thankful to my patrons. I am very thankful to the people who subscribe to the channel. And because it's made a lot of benefit for my life in terms of being able to carry out research. But I try and answer everyone's questions because I think if you take the time to write a question, and it's a legitimate question, i.e. it's not asking me something random and spurious, which frankly is completely out of my realms of expertise or knowledge to be able to answer, then I always try and answer them. Now, what I would say, Richard, is I actually have your questions in here. I have your question, your very long question, as its own slide. And I'm going to go through the other Crepot screams to where I have it, because it is a very long question. <laughs> it should have come up. But no, it's not come up. Oh, well. So give me a second. Found it. 
for some reason it hadn't copied in. Apologies. So here it is. And you can see when I started doing this. So here's my non patron fixed income question laid out in respect to the series as a whole. Episode 1, the R-Class. We love to hate them, but my take is that they were necessary. Before World War I, there was a clear political need to demonstrate that Britain could not just build better ships in Germany, but they could build so many more than uh, the German naval race was point uh, the German, race, uh, German naval race was pointless. The fact it didn't work because the Kaiser had issues and wanted a big fleet to play with doesn't change that it was a politically responsible thing to do at the time. I would argue that in the nicest way, they didn't order start off by ordering eight. They start off by ordering four and then order four more because the Germans do build. So that it's not a straight up order of eight. If it had been a straight up order of eight from the get go, that's a different scenario. Then it makes sense. But they're ordering four and then they order four more. So that's my debate on that. That's my point on that one. Episode two. RNS, brilliant idea, well executed. Yes, all the problems you mentioned are real, but the introduction of a new military concept always requires the of doctrine and testing a theory that will often prove unsound in detail. Only sorts out with time and experience. True. So three, thanks, very informative. But if you assume anything innovative is crackpot, no, I'm using actual what people, some people said about tanks when they were, uh, they were uh, first proposed, uh, it all doesn't mean in crackpot. He may have had a vision way beyond what the average person would consider, but this doesn't automatically even the negative and the negative combinations of the word crackpot. I call it insightful innovation. The thing is, there's uh, we might call something a crackpot scheme in hindsight, but my definition is a crackpot scheme if it's considered a crackpot scheme at the time. The tank is considered a crackpot scheme by many at the time, which is why the Admiralty pushes it through and the Landship Committee rather than the Army. Episode 4. Gallipoli, uh, Gallipoli. Good idea. Bad executed. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Episode 5. Altmark. Superb introductory discussion. I gather this is why you skipped discussing the research into carriers more made from ice. Norway campaign is good idea. Badly executed. But I'm not sure that this falls to Churchill. He did pick Lord Cork and Orrery. Frankly, this one seems to go to Chamberlain rather than Churchill and most of it. The one thing that really falls on Churchill is Cork and Orrery, but his meltdown as an officer wasn't really predictable given his early career. Also, it doesn't seem feasible to talk about Swedish iron ore. Germany would have invaded Sweden. The Allies were in no position to save them, even Norway went perfectly. If you have secured Norway and you have troops in Norway as supporting the Norwegian government in holding Norway, and the, the Swedish would have been on full alert and were on full alert, then things become very different. Especially for a protective German invasion of Nor uh, German invasion of Sweden, because where is Germany going to get the ships from to invade Sweden if they've just lost the ships invading Norway? This is the point. You can't just magically go. The troops are in Sweden. They have to actually get there. Episode six, four C. As a Canadian, I've certainly heard many. We should have sent nothing arguments given what happened to our troops in Hong Kong. These do suffer from 2020 hindsight, and also don't take into account the, uh, the racist expectation the Japanese weren't as effective as they were. Uh, that tends to be overblown. In fact, there were large numbers of British high commanders, I may point a minute point, who really do have an accurate understanding of the Japanese and the threat they offer. Though, uh, also, you have to remember, the Battle of Tsushima by this point is 34 years ago. They, the British know how good the Japanese Navy are. They trained them. They've also been watching them for the last 20 years. There was also the incorrect belief that the ships alone had sufficient anti-air defense. No, they were supposed to be coordinated with land-based aircraft, but operating on radio silence and not breaking that is what caused the trouble. Without seeing the actual numbers on production, I can't get behind the idea that delaying the capital ships was a bad idea. Without the amount of numbers, I'm going to say that, in general, delaying capital ships may have extended the war, but not producing destroyers could have lost it. And I've got into this quite a bit. That the destroyers, frankly... They were quite viable to be produ produced, uh, but without delaying the aircraft carriers. Delaying the battleships, yes, but I'm not talking about delaying capital ships and saying that was silly. I'm saying delaying the aircraft carriers, which went against the Admiralty advice and all the other advice. It was, therefore, far more about politics than anything else. Um, episode 7, Italy as above. So, whether you like or dislike my assessment of your uh, assessment, of your assessment, my question is this. In my limited experience, baby boom historians have exerted a strong pressure to reverse a uh, revised church on their negative life. Is this the inclusion of crackpot schemes and title of this series a sign that this is as fresh as it exists? Or am I misreading historical academia to some degree? The 1980s and 90s certainly seemed a period of a lot of crackpot historical revision driven by, pub uh, by the publish or perish meta that were scaling back on 10-year opportunities. Is there still a risk that saying anything pro-Churchill might be harmful to a career? Well, 
I'm a contract lecturer at the moment and a very junior one. I'm not sure if I qualify as having an academic career or not. Someone very nicely has asked a question, which I'll probably be answering at some point, where they're asking about academic careers and how do you get one. And mostly I'll go, it's stubbornness and keep going. There are pressures in any industry, in, in any industry, in any large group for certain viewpoints. But academia tends to have quite a few vicious fights. Uh, I, I was once a professor told me, uh, why are the fights in academia so bad, so fierce? Because the prizes are so small when it's such little things and it's such little to go around, the fights can get very vicious and very nasty. But no, the crackpot in here is more about me. Just, it was the question in patron. It was put in in Patreon, and I thought it was quite an idea, a nice idea, because also crackpot is quite a 1920s, 1930s phrase, and it makes sense to an extent to call it a crackpot, because if it is, that's what they might have called it at that time. And as I said, some of the things I've gone through and talked about, we might in hindsight think, oh, that wasn't a crackpot idea, but at the time they did, and that's the point. And there are things we now consider must have been a crackpot idea, which at that time seemed perfectly sensible. Also, being pro-Churchill is harmful to your career. Well, on balance, I'm pro-Churchill as a rule. I think he does a better job than other potential options to replace him. I think if you have a if you compare him to some sort of perfect idealized person, then he falls down. But the first rule you have to have with humans is they're not perfect. They're human. They are fallible. They are products of their time. And they are also products of their own weaknesses as well as strengths. A perfect leader would be perfect, but no one's perfect. Churchill is the leader we had. He was a lot better than, the, than, the, than many of the other options. In fact, he was better than pretty much any of the other options which presented themselves in 1940. Definitely better than Halifax. A quantum leap ahead of Chamberlain. Who else are you going to pick? You're not going to pick anyone else. You have basically three or four names which are the potential leaders. If this is the the big problem whenever it comes down to revisionist history of World War II is the case of, okay, so we don't like Churchill. If any, the revisionist history of World War II when it's ideologically rather than historically motivated. A good historical survey, it takes a balance view of everyone and goes, well, they have strengths, they have weaknesses, because everyone does have strengths and weaknesses. But when you get, and there have been, there are some histories in some books which are ideologically, or they're written to shock and sell copies, which do take a very extreme view on these various things. You have, again, the Conservatives, majority parliament, a majority party in parliament at the time. So that automatically limits who's going to be prime minister, because they're not going to do what they did in World War One, uh, which was prop up a, a which for well for a certain time after World War One, which is prop up a actual liberal government in a sort of government of national coalition. Then uh, from that party, you then have to pick certain political big beasts. Okay. They have to have credentials for being well-known in the public, seen as a strong leader, because this is a war, and preferably have to be clearly anti-fascist from the Conservatives. That becomes a very short list very quickly. And Churchill doesn't just head that list. He is miles ahead of the rest of the list in terms of the public actually knowing about him. So he becomes the only option. For good or for bad, he's the option. I don't think he does that bad a job. 
it certainly could have gone a lot worse. You could have had a lot, lot worse. So, I mean, he has... So, on the balance, he's uh, good ideas outweighs bad, in my opinion. So let's say he doesn't have bad ideas, or doesn't make some bad decisions, and some bad calls. But it's to say that, yeah, it's not that bad. Yep, yeah, I'm going to have to sort of reinforce that. I was planning on it anyway. Oh, right. Next questions. Asian J, why not invade northern Norway and force Germany to attack Sweden if they want to win up there? With Sweden on the Allied side, you get an army of 500,000 men, an excellent basis for submarines and aircraft just north of Germany. That seems like a better plan invading Italy. If you think the terrain for invading Italy is tough, fighting from south to north, Invading northern Norway and fighting the Germans up there and trying to push it is going to be very, very difficult. Besides, suckering the Germans into reinforcing Norway with commando operations has been a key plan of the Allies for many, many years, and that means Norway is full of to the brim of German soldiers. They want to lead them up there with as little to do as possible, because frankly they don't fancy fighting them that terrain, so no. Good, nice idea, but no. Cajun, anyone else disappointed that the SAS, SOE, and other unconventional warfare schemes didn't get mentioned anywhere? Because that's not really an idea from Churchill, but it might come in the ongoing um, discussion of other operations and other things which are crackpot schemes. Anyway, good lord, I do believe we have finished the World War II ones. And I have a feeling this is going to be 88 minutes long. So, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. And thank you to all my patrons for supporting me. Thank you to everyone who's joined the channel. Thank you to everyone who's subscribed. Thank you to everyone who shares and likes the videos. Thank you to everyone who comments. Thank you to all the commenters who I've read out and discussed because you have brought up interesting ideas and I have tried to discuss them as well as I can. I know I haven't provided illustrations for discussions, but that's because I've been using the same slide as I did when I did the videos to try and talk it through. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for all you've done. And, um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. And the third part will be recorded probably on the 15th of August <laughs> in the morning. So hopefully it'll be recorded before the uh, recorded so it goes live at the time it's supposed to. Anyway, take care. Thank you. And um, have a nice day.